It's us again. Day two. Session two. Yeah, okay. Session two. Hey guys, I hope you're at home. As you can see, we are in our themed Anvil shirts. Uh, I hope you're at home wearing your theme because if not, uh, you know, you're not part of team player and we want team players part of Camp 10. So be team player. Now, being team player is also mean you have to abide by some rules and there's some housekeeping issues that my brother Jonathan has to go over with you guys. So I've got some housekeeping rules to go over. Uh, I got some good news and I got some bad news. Bad news, the swim dock is closed. The, um, the slide is closed. The archery and the referee is closed. Um, the gym is closed. You know what, as a matter of fact, I think almost everything is closed. But I hope we're still following our social distancing rules and I got good news. Although all that is closed right now, you know, the word of God is always open. And we're gonna be going into our chapel service. We have a wonderful time. We're gonna have some more music with Ashley Milne. And after that, our dear brother Josh is gonna continue in the series of Unprecedented. But before we start that, I'm gonna call brother Chris and he's gonna open in a word of prayer. Let's pray. Our loving Lord and Heavenly Father, we just thank you for, for Anvil. We thank you for all those that wanna be up here at Anvil, Lord. And, 2020 has been a difficult time for some, uh, so some people that have lost family members or are just been ill this time, but we just trust in you. We know that you have a plan for each one of us, and we just trust in you with, with wholehearted faith, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that uh, for the opportunities at Anvil, and I thank you for those that are putting stuff together um, to, to really share in this time to remember you and to worship you. We pray now for Josh, Lord, as he opens the word. We pray that we really will hear you, Lord, through his word, um, that you be lifted up and we be encouraged by Lord, we just give you thanks and trust in you for all these things we do pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Two, three, four. I'm so glad I learned to trust in precious Jesus' Savior friend. Greetings again in the name of the Lord Jesus. Uh, again, my name is Josh, and this is the second segment of a handful of video snippets that I've been given the privilege of recording for you folks that perhaps had hoped to be in attendance this year at Camp 10 Anvil Island. Um, I hope you don't mind. I'm driving right now. I'm beaming to you from Portage La Prairie, Manitoba. Uh, don't ask me why, but uh, 
I've got a few irons in the fire right now, and I trust that uh, you won't be too distracted by the fact that I'm driving. Um, as a husband of one and a father of three with one on the way, surprise! Um, yeah, there's, there's, uh, there's a lot that a guy's got to do in a given day, and uh, hoping with I can two birds with one stone. You understand what I'm talking about. Um, if you tuned into the last segment, you know that we're dealing with the theme of unprecedented. Uh, something that's never been done before, something that's never been known before, but specifically within the context of what would God call unprecedented? A being that exists outside of time, timeless, ageless, no beginning, no ending, eternal, all-powerful, almighty, uh, uh, dwells in unapproachable light. What, what, the, what would an almighty being consider to be unprecedented? And uh, we've given a few examples already, if you tuned into the last segment. One being uh, the Incarnation. The fact that God Himself, the Heaven of Heavens, cannot contain Him. And yet this being has condescended, has limited Himself to flesh and blood, to, uh, to breathing, to all the limitations of humanity, for the sake of, as the Scripture describes, for the suffering of death. And why is He dying? He's dying for you. He's dying for me. I mean, we've got uh, so many faith systems, even examples from biblical history of, of the, create, uh, the creature, that is humanity, offering to the cre crea uh, Creator. Um, but there's only one example in history where we have the Creator offering or sacrificing to the creature or on behalf of the creature, and that is in the cross of Jesus Christ. Um, these are unprecedented uh, instances, uh, things that God would and the angels in heaven would understand to be, have never been done before and never been known before. Uh, absolutely incredible. Today, um, or at, in this segment I should say, we're going to be looking at uh, uh, unprecedented in the sense of the betrayal of the Lord Jesus. Again, we're in John's Gospel, chapter 18. Uh, we looked briefly at verse 1. We're going to be looking at verse 2. And obviously, I don't have a Bible in front of me. I'm trying to be a law-abiding citizen here. But verse 2 of John, chapter 18, deals with Judas. Um, Judas. Here's someone who is unprecedented in his front row seat access to the Lord Jesus. You see, he had, uh, he had way more privilege than you and I did in the sense that he, for the course of three and a half years, could literally reach out his hand and touch God incarnate. Here's someone who had been handpicked by the Lord Jesus among 11 others that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. Here's someone who had been given power by the Lord Jesus to perform miracles, uh, that, that they would have power or authority over sicknesses and illnesses and diseases and demons. This is someone who sat under the teaching of the Lord Jesus and had heard all his sermons. This is someone who again had witnessed many, if not most, of his miracles. And yet, after all of that, here's someone unprecedented in the sense that he kissed the door of heaven and he went to hell. Here's someone that the Lord Jesus says it was better if he had never been born. Very sober, very solemn. And the simple question I would ask you this morning, Judas was an individual who looked the part. He had all the outward appearances of someone who was sold out for the Lord Jesus. Remember there when the Lord Jesus instituted the Last Supper and he said, one of you here at this table will betray me? And, and the disciples were kind of looking at each other puzzled and, and the question was floated, is it I? Is it I? It's like nobody was pointing the finger at Judas and saying, yeah, it's, it, it's totally him. In other words, he fit right in. Uh, there was nothing immediately obvious, at least from the outside, that would suggest this guy was going to stab the Lord Jesus in the back. Unprecedented. And the question I guess I'd have for you, I, I don't know what your story is. Uh, I'm, uh, I know my story is that for 17 years I played a religious game. I was someone who uh, darkened the door of a church from a young age. I was taken to church and attended church from... Well, nine months before I was born, 
uh, literally grew up under the sound of the Word of God. I went to Sunday school. I, I could rehearse the songs. I could quote to you John 3.16 from four or five years old. But at the end of the day, it had no bearing on my heart. It was all just a Sunday morning event. Uh, it was something that I did at a certain time, at a prescribed place, at a prescribed time once a week. But as soon as I walked out of those doors, it was like the director coming on the, the, the stage of a, of a Hollywood movie set and going, cut, with the clapboard. And that was it. That was the extent of my Christianity. It had no practical bearing whatsoever on the decisions, the choice, and the direction of my life. It was all just a religious game. But again, I played the part. You, I mean, you looked at me and I was considered a respectable attendee of the church youth group. And yet I, was, I would have gone straight to hell with a Bible under my arm. Folks, uh, it is so easy to fool ourselves and it's so easy to fool others. The question I have for you is, is are you being real with God? <laughs> I, I, what, one of the things I love about God and one of the things that in some ways is terrifying about God is the fact that He knows everything. We're not fooling Him. He searches the minds and the hearts. Paul says that He will judge the secrets of men according to my gospel. We read uh, even of the Word of God itself is described as a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And it's, it's something of a mirror, the perfect law of liberty in which we look into and, and we see something of what we're like, something of what we're like from God's assessment. And so in the midst of all of this, where do you stand before God? Uh, later on we'll read, and actually I'm parked now so I can actually turn there, but in, in that chapter 18 of John, we'll read in, I believe it's verse 4, let me turn there, John chapter 18 again. Uh, looking at verse, uh, actually no, verse uh, verse 5. After uh, uh, the question the Lord Jesus had posed to those that had come to arrest him, he asked, who are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And so Jesus says, I am he. And it says, and Judas who betrayed him also stood with them. Them being the officers and the chief priests and the detachment of troops that had come to arrest the Lord Jesus. Obviously, this is a very hostile crowd. This is a, ba a bad sign. I'm closing my Bible. I shouldn't do that. Um, here we see Judas standing with those that would eventually consign Jesus to his earthly demise. That is the death of the cross. These are the enemies of the Lord Jesus. And Judas is standing with him. Now, folks, just because we go to church on Sunday morning, just because maybe we have something of a Bible reading plan, just because we're an attendee of the youth group, just because a great majority of our friends are professing Christians, it doesn't mean you're born again. It doesn't mean that you have new life from above. You see, the Lord Jesus described Judas as a devil. It, he says that, he goes on to say it would be better that if he had never been born. Here's someone who in his heart had no appreciation, had no uh, worthy appraisal, if you will. You know how you go to appraise a diamond to see how much it's worth? Or you go to appraise a house to see what its market value should be? In the same way, Judas didn't have a very high value of the Lord Jesus. And how do we know that? He betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. Now contrast that to Nicodemus. And some of you have probably heard of Nicodemus. He makes an appearance in John's Gospel chapter 3. He was a ruler of the Jews. He had come to Jesus by night and he had asked some very uh, uh, searching questions. He was obviously one who was doing a lot of soul searching. And the Lord Jesus says to him, Unless a man is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Well, fast forward till after the Lord Jesus had been crucified and the time was, it was now time for him to be buried. And Nicodemus shows up to bring a mixture of myrrh and aloes, a hundred pounds of it, to then wrap the body of the Lord Jesus with, binding him with straps and linen with these hundred pounds of spices. Uh, that's in John's Gospel, chapter 19. A hundred pounds of myrrh and aloe. I mean, 
Uh, I don't think Nicodemus was carrying this them himself. It was likely he needed like a, well, probably not a wheelbarrow, maybe some sort of ancient cart or a donkey or a mule of some sort. This was a significant load of spices. And you think, well, what's the big deal with myrrh and aloes? You'll read in Psalm chapter 45, verse 8, that the garments of the king, the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah, are, are smelling, are exuding this aroma of myrrh and aloes. It is obvious that Nicodemus valued the Lord Jesus as a king, as one who is in authority, as a ruler, as the Messiah. See, he recognized the value of the Lord Jesus, and he, he spared no expense in giving him a proper burial. Judas, on the other hand, contrast or compare that with 30 pieces of silver. And so the question I would have for you is, how do you value the Lord Jesus? What appraisal do you have on Him? You see, it's so easy to live in this world of churchianity and yet not think much of the person of Jesus Christ, of Him not to actually be a reality in your life that actually changes things. Actually, it makes a difference with your choices day in and day out. What have you done with Jesus? Um, uh, one other thing that, that comes to mind on, on that particular uh, 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 point is, is the fact that Judas, uh, he kissed the Lord Jesus. He said, Rabbi, Rabbi, or Master, Master. And it's like he, he said the right thing. He, he paid him respect with his lips. And then it says when he's betraying him, he kissed him. And so he even showed him some affection. And yet then he betrays him. That was the way that the soldiers would know to identify this Jesus of Nazareth who would be taken to be crucified. That, here, the, uh, Judas, over the course of his ministry alongside of the Lord Jesus, uh, preaches, does miracles, hears the Lord's sermons, sees all his miracles, shows him affection, uh, affiliated with those who, who would uh, eventually go and die martyrs' death for the sake of Christ, who had a number, uh, had a part with the ministry of the early apostles, and yet we see that in the end he valued the Lord Jesus at 30 pieces of silver. What does the Lord Jesus mean to you? And uh, I, I trust these thoughts will, will be of some blessing to you. Uh, we'll continue in the next segment on this theme of unprecedented. Lord bless you. I confess, now in here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need Songs and cries.